Welcome back to the Aspen Artificial Intelligence Week here from Berlin. And I'm very pleased to hand over to my colleague for today, Sarah Polak. And I can tell from the pre-chat you just had with Michael, you have a lot to talk about. Uh, so please take it away for us. You're going to be talking uh, about the cultural impacts of artificial intelligence. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for, for having me. I'm also particularly honored because I'm a member of the Aspen Institute of Central Europe. So it's really nice to see the um, Aspen family come together like this. Um, yes, we just had a bit of a eureka moment with uh, with Michael or um, Professor Michael Betancourt um, here in the uh, pre-chat because his father uh, is an archaeologist who is very active in Minoan Crete. Um, and I'm originally an archaeologist as well. Um, and I actually recall writing essays about um, the things that his father wrote about. So that was a very exciting moment. Um, and I think that it actually highlights really nicely the multidisciplinary um, nature of uh, the talk that we'll be having because um, AI is often seen, uh, especially by the public and often sensationalized by the media um, as a very new type of technology that is only a basically reserved for the IT elite, but it definitely isn't that way. Um, we need to approach AI as a new steam engine, as a new um, invention of writing, because it's essentially a new invention for humanity that's going to shift us into the next evolutionary stage. Um, and I'm really excited to be having this chat with Michael because he embodies multidisciplinarity as an artist, as a, a critical writer, um, as a film expert, um, someone who really lives and breathes the world around him. Um, he simultaneously sees the practical and socioeconomic impacts of AI, especially on the job industry. But also he, what I particularly love, just to give you a bit of a teaser of the presentation, manages to tie it beautifully with um, the philosophies that our modern world has arisen from um, and things like the Industrial Revolution, which have often dictated the way in which we work and live. Uh, uh, and structure our lives. So I won't say any more than that. It's a great honor to be here with you, Michael. Um, I'm glad that we're having this multidisciplinarity um, AI chat. Um, and I've got loads of juicy questions prepared for you, and I'm sure that the public will as well. But for now, I will uh, keep stumm and give uh, space and place um, to your wonderful presentation that I've seen already, but I can't wait to see again because it's absolutely um, breathtaking. So take it away. Um, have I been switched? Okay, here I am. Now, let me just share screen. And the presentation. All right. I'm going to be talking about the cultural impacts and impediments to what I'm calling the post-labor society that AI presents. This talk is a discussion of insights derived from my analytic work with digital capitalism, and it's specifically a summary of a book called Force Magnifier that was written as a response to the invitation to do this conference last year. This is a talk that's going to discuss seven issues. I'm going to go through them in order and talk about what they are and what their ramifications are. But I want to start with the question which is really rather obvious and which we don't seem to ask very often about auto, uh, automated systems and AI. What does AI automate? And the simple answer is human agency. But it's important to keep in mind that not all forms of human agency have the same cultural importance, and not all forms of AI have impacts on production, nor do they all necessarily displace human agency in the same ways. So, Keeping those things in mind, it means that we're only going to be talking about a limited range of applications for AI and in relation to a very particular understanding of human agency. It's one that emerges following the Enlightenment, which we can see quite clearly in Kantian philosophy, as the distinction between what he calls determinative judgment and reflective judgment. These are distinctions in the qualia of human agency, and they have impacts rather directly in the ways in which capitalism has developed and the ways in which we're automating it with AI. Determinative judgment is the application of rules to produce rote outcomes. It's typical of labor. This is not a kind of human agency that's highly valued in Kant's proposal. It directly leads to things like the Taylorist assembly line, where human labor is essentially pre-thought in advance, minimizing the need or role of agency in that production. In contrast, reflective judgment, this is the 
agency of invention, what Kant associates with what's called genius. This is very highly valued for creative activity. This is what we call agency when we talk about creative activity. What AI automates is a set of decisions made within carefully predefined rules. In other words, AI is an automation of determinative judgments. This is what machine learning is deriving, and what we get with machine learning is the matching of the imminent that we encounter right now to a carefully predefined set of past situations defined by rules. What AI makes discoveries with, and this is what something like Alpha Zero is making discoveries with, is the result of a predetermined set of rules in which ramifications and applications of those rules that we do not necessarily see are articulated by the autonomous system mapping out what all of the potential applications of those rules might be. This is why Alpha Zero doesn't play like a program that we've written, it doesn't play like a person, but it plays in an alien way, as Demis Hassabis has noted. Now, what comes into this as a crucial factor is what I call the aura of the digital. This is a fantasy about digital technology that separates its impacts and costs and operations from the social dimensions and social impacts of that technology. What I call post-labor arises as an affect of this aura of the digital. It's a product of how the illusion that the digital is a self-productive domain, that it creates value without expenditure, that it separates quite irretrievably the physical from the implementation, and it and completely elides social impacts. The assumption that with AI there will be no more jobs for people is a reflection of this fantasy of the aura of the digital, which then makes the obvious question. If post-labor doesn't eliminate jobs, what is the society of leisure? What is it that this post-labor produces? Well, I'm using this concept to describe a collection of changed social relationships that emerge with the replacement and reduction of rote human labor by AI and automation in general. It doesn't mean that people aren't working anymore. It doesn't mean that we don't have all of the aspects that we're familiar with. It means that they're all transformed in one way or another. And that's what I'm going to talk about as I go through these seven conclusions from Force Magnifier, my book. The first has to do with human labor. What happens when this occurs is that human labor ceases to be the foundation of value, and that ends up being very important because wealth, currency, and commodity distribution are all linked together as proxies for class distinctions, which is to say they're ultimately about labor, how it's valued, and the differential kinds of labor that people perform. This matters because in capitalism, what we call capitalism is ultimately a matter of value derived from human agency. Without human agency, there's no value, there's no distribution of value, there's no exchange values being produced. This is really a reflection of the historical definition of capitalism itself, the exchange of human productive activity, that is to say, agency, as a commodity in itself. What we need to keep in mind when talking about all of these relationships is that historically labor is understood as unskilled, unintelligent, and only minimally educated, and that these are reflections of what the labor was for most of the history of capitalism, even into the 20th century. When we talk about human labor, we're really talking about the labor of unskilled adults and children. This is a photograph from North Carolina in the United States in 1908 showing what some of these labor conditions look like and who it is that's doing the labor. Keeping that in mind, when we talk about the two categories of labor that are performed in capitalism, these relationships between skilled and unskilled, child labor versus the labor of management begins to make sense. Productive labor is these rote determinative judgments. It is readily automated. It is readily shift to an assembly line. And the shift to assembly line makes sense when you're talking about child labor. At the same time, the managerial control of that labor has tended to be regarded as reflective judgment. But what AI has revealed is that a lot of this administrative labor is actually roles that are rote, that are determinative. But that isn't actually that important. 
because AI is responding to a managerial fantasy in which there is a complete and total control over production, in which the determinative judgments are not filtered through the interpretations of labor, but are directly implemented. We can see this in the desire of the assembly line, in the Taylor's fragmentation of labor, in the minimizing of human thought process by that labor. Looked at in those terms, AI is simply an extension of what is already in play before its emergence. But we get a shift in value and the nature of value with AI. And this shift suggests a rupture with the historical system of capitalism and its entire productive apparatus. In capitalism, currency is a medium of exchange that is connected to the conversion of agency into a commodity. What we get in this exchange is a receipt for past labor performed. And it's this past labor performed that allows the distribution of commodities. When we have a shift in labor, so it is no longer the basis for this kind of production, it becomes no longer the basis for these kinds of exchange, and this is a disruption to the entire cycle of wages and profits. What we get with AI is a shift in the nature of value away from past production and towards futurity, towards the ability, the right to initiate production, rather than being a title to past production. The model for this kind of value production is reflective judgment, what we could call design. And as a result of that, it sets also some other historical features of creative production. And it makes them rather obvious to us. We can see at the beginning of the computer era, the computer artist who's also one of the early computer programmers, Michael Knoll, noting that the creative process is something that happens in the mind of the artist. Its production or reflection in the artwork is simply a rendition of whatever that process is. Computers are starting to allow us to automate at least superficial dimensions of this process, as this picture by Brett Corston, a piece called The Next Rembrandt, a computer-generated Rembrandt painting based on the work of Rembrandt, makes the model for this kind of value production really clearly performative. But it's also functionally resistant to the automation. While it may be possible to automate a Rembrandt based on Rembrandt's past works, you have to create those past works first. And then once you've created that automation, you also have to select it, choose which work is used. And that's because creative solutions are not interchangeable. We can't take a painting by Theo van Gogh and replace it with a painting by his brother and expect them to be equivalent just as we can't look at the things that AIs generate on their own and expect them to be equivalent to human production, however interesting they might be to us as humans looking at these works. What that means for us is that reflective judgments become very clearly subject to what's called Belmo's cost disease, in which the generative production of creative works remains dependent on our capacity to select the result, and it's that selection that constrains the ability to generate profits. We can see that quite clearly with something like this. This picture is the selfie created by a maquette selected by nature photographer David Slater, who also allowed and, and, um, and enabled its production by placing cameras where the monkeys could interact with them. But because the selfie is produced by the monkey, David Slater must then select from all of the other potential selfies made by the same monkey in order to arrive at the singular image that might have value for us. Currency production in becoming a title to initiate production is also a shift in the nature of that currency and the nature of how commodity distribution works. Because access to commodities, that is to say the distribution of production, has always been a signifier of class position. And that matters to us because wealth functions as a proxy for class. Commodity access is also a proxy for class. Changes in the nature of currency thus do not dis disrupt, but instead accentuate our existing class structures. And that's because currency in a capitalist society is a mechanism controlling commodity distribution. So as the post-labor economy emerges and human labor is replaced with the unpaid operation 
of digital computers. This eliminates the costs of wages, and so you stop having people being paid. So the replacement of human labor with AI becomes an example of just how this aura of the digital enables the fantasy that we can extract an infinite amount of wealth from finite resources. It becomes a kind of magical production in which there is no consumption, there is no loss of profit. Now, parallel to this, we have a change in cultural authority, not its diminution, but rather its increasing, its augmentation. And in many ways, these cultural roles are already being subsumed by digital systems, by automated systems, by computers. Some of them are simply ridiculous, like this screenshot in which the computer program to play music, sound files, can't open because the screen has not enough resolution. But it's really demonstrative of something else. The idea of a pluralistic horizontal mass communication system challenges the stability of the dominant political and ideological power in any given society. That was noted 30 years ago by a video artist named Francis Torres. And while the internet and social media are clearly horizontal communication systems, what these systems have done is allow more divergent viewpoints, more valorization, more expansion, more democracy, but at the same time, it's also made the gatekeepers controlling that, controlling those selections that much more powerful, that much more obvious, in part because the AI systems that run these gatekeepers, that really are the actual gatekeepers, the algorithms, are designed to maximize attention, as to say, to maximize value generation, rather than maximizing any kind of public good or social cohesion. This is a reflection of structural demands in capitalism being automated. And this structural demand for profit generation is not in itself compatible with any other demands. Any other demands have to be enforced and put upon it rather than selected automatically. The kinds of surveys that Facebook has been appropriately criticized for, like the two that you can see here, are examples of how these companies are interested in maximizing their own power, in maximizing their own profit generation, without necessarily paying any attention to legal, cultural, or social restraints. In fact, as the questionnaires here demonstrate, it's really about avoiding those kinds of constraints and accountabilities. But the autonomous editorial control and censorship that these systems produce, these gatekeepers have, makes these controls both imminent and at the same time largely invisible. What you don't get to see being censored, you don't get to see because you don't know what it was that was censored. We have here an example of that, two posts, the same post, presented at different times with some of the content removed by one of these automated systems. The cycle of wages and profits becomes something that requires social maintenance as this post-labor society emerges. It's not an issue of centrally planned production, but of enabled consumption. And enabling consumption is what allows the existing systems of distribution to continue to function. I know this diagram is just a grotesque oversimplification of these relationships, but it also captures the fundamental dynamic that the entire economic system of capitalism that has become digital, that is being transformed by automation, is a system in which wages are conceived as lost profits. And the entire idea that you cycle wages into profits and that what profits cycle back into wages is something that is fundamentally disrupted as you remove those wages from this system. The aura of the digital is the reason that these wages are being conceived as lost profits. The invention and the shift to AI enables the replacement of labor with the fixed cost of a machine. It's a system in which we're going to see and are already seeing the automation of low status jobs becoming a concern and increasingly a concern as it renders human labor increasingly dependent on social supports. At the same time, it also automates higher status and high status jobs, thus eliminating the capacities of the middle class to support the economy through consumption because it creates financial insecurity for these classes. This is a problem familiar and historical 
within capitalism as a whole. Joseph Schumpeter, the economist who noted after World War II that the high social dominance orientations of capitalism justifies and in many ways authorizes the deprivation of all the lower classes. What happens as this occurs is that the means of production becomes a commodity in itself. We see a shift to on-demand and just-in-time production that accompanies the elimination of standing reserves. All of these are dimensions of the same process. It's an attempt to resolve the slowing of the rate of profit, and this happens through the elimination of stored value and the conversion of all past production, not to being a source of value, but to being an expense that slows and otherwise impedes the rate of profit. The AI systems and their productive capacity, especially those that are independent of human labor entirely, allow a bespoke production of singular commodities on demand for singular audiences. This is a shift towards custom production, universal and singular production. Productive capacity is the commodity, not human labor, not the thing that it generates, the commodity itself, but actually the production. Universal basic income has been proposed as a solution to the disruption that AI poses for the cycle of wages and profits. But we need to keep in mind when confronting this that consumption, and thus wages, is a proxy for social position, and that it's not just about how much you consume, but what you consume, the costs associated with it, the status associated with it, that really define how consumption is a proxy for social position. And it's been that way for hundreds and hundreds of years. So when we look at universal basic income, what we are seeing are three general models being proposed. The first is financed through taxation and is provided as a direct governmental payout. The second is financed through debt, that is to say a periodic jubilee that abolishes the debts allowing the system to continue. And then the third version, which is, a same, which is in some ways the same version as the second one, but without the jubilee in which you end up creating vast debts that must be repaid through obligations that are then imposed on large sections of society. But how we finance this is a question of monetary policy. And what I'm really interested in talking about today is not a question of finance, but of how social factors constrain the implication of any kind of universal basic income. In order for this to work, the goal should be, and really needs to be, to eliminate all human labor as a necessity. The reason that it needs to be the elimination of all human labor as a necessity is that if wealth remains a social marker for class, universal basic income will increase social strife and accentuate the existing divisions within society, and this will ultimately lead to it failing to preserve the social order that we have. It will instead become a driver of its breakdown. Traditional cultural ideologies are the reason that this is a problem. The society of leisure is blocked and impeded through the demonization of inactivity, the ways in which social order is justified by the social hierarchy in a reflexive and circular fashion. This is built into both religion and all forms of social support. The belief that labor is a necessary precondition for survival has been highlighted by the various and differential responses to the ongoing economic and social impacts of the virus. In many ways, the virus has acted as a magic mirror, realizing many of the things that we are talking about as hypotheticals just a year ago as imminent problems that are becoming only more obvious as time passes. We have built into our societies a cultural rejection of idleness for the lower classes. Idleness, leisure, these are concerns and preoccupations not of labor, but of management. They are reflections, the capacity to have them is a reflection of the social position of the people enjoying it. The ability to expand, to 
raise labor to this level where they are no longer needed, where they are furloughed, where they are idle, creates the society of leisure, but it also creates and runs directly into these historical impediments that make leisure and its consumption a class distinction. So, our pandemic has given us several very clear lessons. The first is that automation has not and is probably not going to solve any of the problems that we're encountering. In many ways, automation is simply accentuating them, and the pandemic has simply accelerated that shift. That social class is still a primary dimension of labor, and that social class really determines what we value. Ironically, the most essential kinds of labor that are being performed are the most menial, insignificant, and generally denigrated, low-value, low-status, low-importance sorts of labor. And that's something that the pandemic has really made quite clear. At the same time, the society that we have now that's dominated by these digital technologies, these on-demand productions, this shift to immediacy, to contingency, in which we eliminate our standing reserves, has left us with a brittle society that takes very little to destabilize. It takes very little to push it into a state of, well, crisis. Even without the virus, we would be in crisis because of the ways in which people don't have the money and we don't have the production and we don't have the distribution of that production to support where we are now. There is no easy or simple solution to these challenges. They're emergent from the very deep, very basic foundations of our social organization. And this is a social organization that developed not for an industrial society or an automated society, but for a society based around human labor in subsistence economies, societies based on vast scarcities that are only marginally under control at any given moment. In order to make a transition to a society where we don't have that, which is something that we needed to do even before AI, and which the virus has only made that much clearer, we need to change the underlying entrenched values that block the capacities to make the adaptation, to raise people's social status, to change how we define and how we value social position in society. Any short-term solution that we would pick that might resolve these problems needs to be uniformly implemented and must have a consistent program of support and promotion from social and religious leaders in order to change and alter these foundational assumptions about how our society is organized and how our society should be based. What AI has revealed is not a financial but a social problem, not an issue of economics, but an issue of how economics, religion, and education all act together to affirm an existing social hierarchy, one that is poorly matched to the conditions that we have now, with or without the virus, accentuating and revealing the problems, in a sense, immediately as a kind of fast forward. Thank you. Michael, thank you so much. Um, I, I feel that there should be a round of applause right now because this is the annoying thing with online conferences that you can't easily do that. But I'm completely flabbergasted because basically what we've spoken about here is um, uh, things like universal basic income, which obviously is often, again, flouted as a very sexy PR phrase. But what precedes that is a radical socioeconomic change that um, it, people sometimes view as se separate from the whole debate on AI, but actually those two are really tightly interconnected. And it's a very fine line between realizing the true interconnectivity of new innovations and the socioeconomic structures and just um, kind of plain political talking about things that people, that pe people, states, politicians, things that pe think that people want to hear, like reskilling without any actual like plan on how to do that. Because exactly as you say, um, if we really want to embed AI in society and help it change and propel us forward truly, and not just by installing a few apps based on like very simple machine learning versions, um, we will need to really change the way that we think about social structure. Um,
actually going back to um, when I was introducing you, and obviously, you know, your, your, your father being an archaeologist who studied the transformation of society, the Minoan society concretely, that went through a lot of very rapid changes, including writing um, and script and culture and uh, iconography. Um, it's not actually that different from what we're talking about here now. And something that I am really fascinated by is the whole idea of multidisciplinarity and what actually encouraged you to take this viewpoint and write your book in the first place, because um, it's quite a cognitive leap sometimes to even dare go into the arena of AI in this in this type of like multifaceted way. And I'm just curious if we start from a really big picture question from my end, um, how you came about it and what really gave you that impetus of... I re really need to write something on this topic. Well, um, it's hard to know where things like that really come from. But what I can say is that a lot of the time when I read these, and I read a great many things about AI and preparing my earlier work on digital capitalism and preparing the book and presentation for this conference, what I was struck by was just how much it was all saying the same things and how much of it depended on a, at least from my perspective, being in a sense an outsider, a set of really obvious to me assumptions about how society works, what can change, what can't change. It's been said that it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. And yet a lot of the things that are being talked about with AI point towards an end of capitalism, at least as we understand it, a, a fundamental transformation of the whole system of value, the whole system of exchange, the whole notion of social position. If consumption is a marker for class, then industrialization undermines those markers. Historically, you know, 200 years ago, 300 years ago, uh, the aristocracy have a very different diet than the peasants. They have very different lives than the peasants, not just because they're aristocracy, not just because they're peasants. That's just a, a, a shorthand for what's happening. But when you have industrialization come along, suddenly you have people eating very similar foods, having very similar products. In, in some cases, especially in the 20th century, they have the same products. If the Queen of England wants to drink a Coke, she's going to drink the same Coke that the bum up the street from me here in Savannah is going to drink and no amount of money will get her a better Coke than that bum has. That's a major transformation in society, but it's one in which we really haven't thought through what that means. But we're now in the process of implementing this automated production that allows everybody to have a custom item that's completely unique and special and just for them. And in a way, we already have that every time you type a search into Google, you get a custom set of results just for you. If you have a Facebook page, your feed is filled with custom results just for you. And we haven't really thought about what that means. We haven't really talked about what that means. Because this custom production just for you is being made by a machine, by an automation that spies on you all the time, and then it doesn't decide on things that it thinks you would like. It presents you with things it thinks you would like that make money for its owner, which is a very different situation than something that you would like or that might be good for you. And that's why we need to think about these things in bigger and broader terms. It's not just about algorithms. It's not just about whether this algorithm or that algorithm is better or worse. It's about how does this fit together into an entire society? And too much of the time, we seem to lose that society. We lose that sense of how things are connected to each other, not just historically, but just right now. How, you know, how if the Queen's Facebook page and your Facebook page are running on the same application, why is hers radically different from yours? That's something we haven't really talked about as a society. Absolutely. Now, I, I'm, I'm not really sure what the answer to these questions are. But that's why I, I approach things the way I do, because I want answers to these questions, and I don't see them anywhere else. So I have to come up with my own. And what we're really seeing is a failure of models. The historical models that we've received don't match and don't work with the situation we're living in now. They're historical models for a historical time that has different assumptions 
and really very different realities than what we have created. And whatever might have worked critically to address this in the past has been incorporated and assimilated by that system, the, the social system, the economic system, the political system. Take your pick for what you want to call the system. And as a result, our society has changed, but our models for understanding that society don't match the changes. Precisely. Um, what are there? There's so, so many things to, to pick up on here. I think basically what you're um, talking about, there's two main things that I, I really want to highlight. The first is an issue of categories. Um, I remember my old um, cultural anthropology tutor, um, Paul Dresch, he basically said that everything is a question of category, how you define culture, how you define morality, how you define values. I mean, in your presentation, we're looking at a um, generated uh, painting of Rembrandt that's considered to be you know, objectively a phenomenal painter. But, but, but why? Like partially that is the politicization of Charles I's uh, royal art mm -hmm. collection that basically gave Rembrandt the status that he now has, although there were plenty of other painters that, that had an equivalent status or were maybe even better, but obviously saying that now would be, you know, next to blasphemous. And similarly next to blasphemous is the notion of things like capitalism that you mentioned, because, you know, personally, I mean, I'm from a ex-communist country, you know, communism like ruined a lot of my family's lives, but simultaneously, almost begrudgingly, I'm kind of saying, well, capitalism it's not sometimes a sacred cow that it says that it is. And that, that it's not just um, that I would, God forbid, want to revert to communism, but for trying to find a new model, like almost like a new world order that needs to fill the gap between the, um, between the individual and society and the state that is running on those old models and is simply not working anymore. Like you realize that people don't want um, like welfare handouts. They, they, they don't want the, like the old school plug the whole systems that used to be sufficient even 20 years ago, because suddenly they're expecting the state to give them the same level of personalization that Facebook gives you. They're expecting the state to treat them as individuals and not just like as a member of a social strata. Um, but I think that this is symptomatic of the fact that we don't really allow sometimes for critical thinking, because it doesn't matter whether you're left, right, center. I think that all of these political spectrums have pretty much gone out of the window. But even coming out and saying, look, maybe capitalism isn't working, let's find a new system. You have to get through basically five boxing matches before like that is even accepted that you can think that and you can start saying how AI can play a role in this new New, new system that you're designing or this new model that you're suggesting. Um, and that's a very long way of, uh, long-winded way of introducing my second question, which is w when you and I had this discussion, you made this like fascinating um, metaphor or this, this fascinating um, statement that basically AI and like the chaos that it's kind of plunged us into because we're running around like headless chickens um, because we don't know what to do with this invention that's radically changing the world around us. And it's like a natural conclusion of the enlightenment experiment. And that that's now kind of ending. That's great. Um, and we're moving into a new world. Can you tell us a little bit more about that thought and also maybe like your personal prediction, although I realize that it could be wild, but tr try anyway, of what that next stage uh, of society might look like? Well, I think I should first say that it's really tough making predictions, especially about the future. But when we look at something like AI, there's a very real tendency to think about it as this hard break, that it's a, a, a new thing that has no relationship to the past. And, um, well, I, I think that's a fundamental mistake because what we see AI doing, the kind of things that it automates, when you start asking, what does AI automate? Okay, it's automating human agency. Well, okay, which agencies is it automating? The things that are AI is being applied to a peak at the 90th percentile of jobs. So the top 10%, the management jobs, the CEO level or C-level jobs are not being automated. There's really no attempt to develop technology, really, to automate those jobs. And that's because those are the reflective labor jobs, reflective judgments. Those are the people who are in charge. And so they are paid enormous amounts versus the janitor. 400, 500 times the janitor's salary more because their labor is so much more important than the person who comes and picks up the trash. And yet the person who comes and picks up the trash is the essential labor. If they don't come and pick up your trash for two weeks, you're going to notice if the CEO goes on vacation to the golf course 
for two years, you might not even realize they were missing. That's a very huge discrepancy. And it's a discrepancy in value, it's a discrepancy in labor, it's a discrepancy in, es in essential and unessential, but it's also a discrepancy in classification of activity. Because the picking up the trash is so rote, you can build machines to do it. The CEO's labor is supposedly so not rote, you can't build machines to do it. And that's, that's a very interesting dynamic from my point of view. But what it reveals is the continuity going back into the Enlightenment, where the idea that you can build an entire economic system around the transformation of human agency into a commodity, that is the Enlightenment. Capitalism is the economic system the Enlightenment proposes. It's enacting what the Enlightenment is describing. And instead of being emancipatory, for most of its history, it was horribly, horribly totalitarian and repressive. In many respects, your experience you know, in, in the communist bloc versus the capitalist bloc, they're very similar. You have an authoritarian centralized control. It's just in the communist bloc that centralized control is the government. In the capitalist bloc, that centralized control is the corporation. But when you're inside the corporation, you are as stringently controlled, only you're freely supposedly able to leave and change jobs. But in actuality, that's heavily constrained in places like the United States. Right now, leaving your job means you also leave behind your health insurance. So you have no health care. Uh-oh, that's a problem right now in places like the United States that tie that to your employment. And that's one of the things that's really becoming obvious, just how catastrophic that is at least in the United States, to the Americans. But it's a reflection of the same idea that the person in charge, their judgment matters, no one else's judgment matters. The reflective individual who creates and determines what the rules should be versus the people who apply the rules. And that distinction there runs through everything that we talk about in the Enlightenment. It runs through the entire Enlightenment project it distinguishes different kinds of education, why some education is devalued. Let's say you go and get a job to learn to be a plumber. You're not going to be treated with the same social level of respect as if you go and get a job to become a philosopher. It's just the idea that the plumber and the philosopher are receiving the same training doesn't even seem rational. That's this differential in reflective versus determinative. I like Kant because he makes this distinction very, very clear but it's something that runs through all of the Enlightenment, and the capitalist system is a reflection of this, and ironically, the way communism rolled out and was implemented, is still being implemented, is also a reflection of this system, where you have the state making the decisions for everyone else, who is then subject to and controlled by those decisions. It's the same system. Yeah, it's uh, what I find really interesting is like the nature of the scientific method as such, because even if we look at the origins of, say, archaeology, anthropology, or, or, or even biology, and like going all the way back to Linnaeus, um, we see during the Enlightenment this propensity to categorize everything and to show how things go from point A to point B. Uh, I, I personally think that, um, and there is historical evidence that humans have always have some kind of, always have had some kind of like cognitive propensity to explain the world around them. They either did it through religion or magic or then later rigorous science, which sometimes has very similar um, findings to um, something that David Copperfield might produce because um, it is basically like often like the hypothesis building and it's proving um, making differences between the Western scientific method and something that the Zande in um, sub-Saharan Africa do with their oracles is actually based a very similar principle but obviously colonialism has made one superior to the other um but but what, what we basically see is and, and you know emergent from that are things like eugenics that basically you need to suddenly categorize everything around you and give it some kind of a number and some kind of a level in the in the pyramid to be able to shift society forward and to basically optimize it um but i think that this has actually really ruined um like almost pre-ruined the legacy of ai because ai is merciless in the sense that it's completely unbiased um like it doesn't care what data you give it but you have to give it some kind of data so it can train the problem is that the data that we have collected over the last 150 years isn't exactly like a great reflection on us but that's not ai's fault and what honestly always makes me really sad when i see something about like a 
racist algorithm or a, like a gender biased algorithm. The algorithm has got nothing to do with it. It's the it's the cesspool that is either social media or just like humans that that is basically revealing. So it's again we discussed this before. It's um, revealing biases, not necessarily creating them. Um, and my question to you is, where do you think that we should draw the line? Um, because obviously, like you can uh, like manually mute. The, the algorithm or like create it so that it makes you very happy and so that it erases all these problem this problematic past and makes us look fantastic but then you're basically bastardizing science or you can say yep take the data it's not going to be pretty but at least we know what we what, what we're dealing with and we can deal with the post exact situation um in its true form where do you and obviously regulations and the state are the ones making these decisions often sadly um where do you think the line is drawn and how do you think that we should approach this from a the state perspective but also the corporate perspective i'm um, treating those kind of uh, e equally given on what, what you just said but then also how do you think that the public should be engaged in this because it's often the public's data that are being used to train these algorithms in the first place so i feel that they should have a say well right now there's a whole lot of talk about data as like the new oil it's the new commodity that everybody needs it. But in many ways, the technology is already in the process of moving away from this big data approach, where we're already starting to build systems that derive all of their data autonomously. You give them a rule set, they apply the rule set, and in applying that rule set, generate all of the potential outcomes. This is something like AlphaGo and the way it plays Go or chess or AlphaZero which has no data, that's why it's called zero. But the problem is we keep thinking about and talking about bias like it's something separate from, that, that we can remove it, like it's eliminable. Like, like you know, the bias is there, but if we take it out, then everything's fine, but you can't take the bias out. Bias is inevitable. Bias is in some ways something you cannot eliminate. You can only mitigate it. And we need to be talking not about eliminating bias, but mitigating it, about imposing controls so that we don't autonomously generate negative outcomes that we don't want and not even know we're doing it, which is the real danger of these kinds of biases built into AI systems. And the reason for that is most of these AIs do not have transparency, accountability, or explainability. We don't know what they're doing or where the data is coming from. We don't know how that data has been selected. It's not accountable to anyone. There is nobody saying there is no office or business or organization that looks at the data and says, okay, is this data itself inherently biased if we're building from data? And there's very little attempt to explain any of this. The technology is left as, like you said, a kind of magical effect. This is the aura of the digital, that it's a magical thing that just generates value. You turn the crank and money comes out. And those are things that we have to consciously work against because they're ideologies that in many ways our technology has reified that our technology internally references consistently as justifications for how it operates and as ways of evading any kind of oversight. Now, whether this oversight is internal to a corporation or from a government or, or even transnational is, is a different issue than the issue of bias. They get bundled together because very often the only way to address bias is through this kind of oversight. So we tend to think of oversight and bias as being the same thing. You have the bias, you have the oversight that corrects it. But we need to think about them as separate issues. How we have oversight is not the same as how we have bias because the bias is never going to go away. Nothing that we do will ever eliminate it. If you have to make a selection from 10 options, you're going to make a choice, and that choice is going to be biased for the other options that you didn't select. So it's always going to be a political question, what we call bias and how we address it. What we need to do to address it is to make it into something that everyone involved is at least on a level playing field, has the same information. Right now, so many of these algorithms are trade secrets, they're locked up behind closed doors, the data is kept secret, it is kept hidden, it is proprietary. That makes any kind of oversight almost impossible. And as Facebook has demonstrated repeatedly, as Google has demonstrated repeatedly, as Microsoft has demonstrated repeatedly, 
even as Ford Motor Company has demonstrated repeatedly, or Volkswagen has demonstrated repeatedly, or any corporation has demonstrated repeatedly. When they're motivated by profits, we cannot trust them to oversight themselves. It's a, it's a really interesting thing that you've pointed out, which is basically, again, the, um, it's almost not a question of access to AI it's, uh, or the technology. It's access to information about AI. Um, because um, I, I've spoken to a lot, a lot, a lot of friends who um, have worked in these grand corporations who, who shall remain nameless. Um, and the people actually working hands-on with these algorithms that are behind closed the doors, um, they're very explainable. Often they're actually like almost not, not ch childishly simple, but they're really not the rocket science that they claim to be in the PR um, manifests that come out about them. But obviously, um, these people can't speak about it because of, their, of the nature of their employment contract. Um, uh, if these people and uh, these people that I know have definitely tried to make it open source, which would mean democratizing the technology, getting it out there, um, that's a huge internal battle. That, that's intellectual property of the company. Even if you do it in your own time, it's still their intellectual property. So they basically own your brain. Um, and speaking out about the fact, obviously, the company is never going to allow you to say, oh, this algorithm that's like running half of the internet is actually pretty simple. It's basically a statistical model. But I can't say that because I'd be kicked out and I'd be hounded till the ends of the earth. But then what basically happens is this Chinese whispers where you've got the very mundane like AI reality at the bottom. And you've got people mystifying it, mystifying it, mystifying it until it gets to the CEO levels or like the C-level um, people who maybe like joined the company like 10 years ago, but that's already like uh, like ancient by, by the state of like modern um, technology development. So they're actually not even hands-on anymore and they don't properly know what what is going on like underneath the, underneath the hood of the car. Um, and then basically, but who are the people then talking to the politicians who are making the regulations? It's these C-level people who don't even properly know what's going on inside their business. And then the politicians have no idea often, and they just like cherry pick whatever's like best for their digital strategy. And they go, voila, um, I read this um, a thing about um, the EU regulations, I think it was yesterday, where basically we need to regulate um, AI so that um, it's only used for purposes that like don't... Um, what was it like harm humans or cause death? It's like AI is not going to cause death. It's a statistical model. It's the people that are using it in a terrible way to, I don't know, switch off energy in a city that is going to cause death. And it's this access to information that is creating, as you mentioned, the aristocracy, this new meat eating elite that's got access, but not necessarily all, know, knowing all the facts about what's going on under, underneath them. Um, and again, this is like a long winded way of saying that uh, throughout history, we always see people organize themselves in some form of pyramid or in some form of model. Um, do you think that we need to work with the fact that whatever system comes next, um, even if it tries to be utopian and like universal basic income, having like AI um, powering our society, that it's still going to be biased because there's something that's been in us for millions of years that we just can't get rid of because we're humans. Um, to what extent do you think that our society truly is malleable and that we can get rid of those models or that we're going to be stuck in a rut, um, doomed to repeat the same mistakes? Well, that's a great question. That really is the question of, about this technology. And to be honest with you, I don't know. Um, I do know that our society, and even historically, when you get above a certain level of complexity, societies invent their own hierarchies. And the hierarchies happen for a variety of reasons. And it's not the issue of the hierarchy that's the problem. It's the issue of how you administer the society within that hierarchy. If it's a hierarchy constructed so that the people at the top are allowed and encouraged to prevent anyone below them from getting whatever it is that they need, from getting whatever it is that is required just to survive. And then they are punished for it and taught to, to dislike themselves and internalize the punishment so that if they're not working harder and faster and better and more, then they're bad, which is really the last 250 years, then yes, of course, we're going to have problems. Now, is it possible to imagine other sorts of society? Certainly. Are they utopian? Not all of them. Um, many of them could very well resemble the society we have now. It's simply a matter of to what extent do you build a society that authorizes and enables this vast disparity between the person at the top and the person at the bottom. And that disparity is a very recent invention. In the United States, it's less than 50 years old. After World War II, 
the disparity was orders of magnitude smaller in the United States. And the country was more egalitarian. It, it was able to adapt and, in fact, embrace some kinds of social change that it's now struggling with as the, dispar as the economic disparity has increased once more. Uh, in many ways, without that amelioration of social position and social distinction expressed through consumption, expressed through disparities in wealth and value, it's very hard to imagine something like the civil rights movement succeeding. And it, it's easy to forget that a big part of the civil rights movement is organizations like the SDS, the Students for a Democratic Society, who are largely white, affluent, and liberal. And without that additional support, maybe civil rights might not have happened the way it did. It might not have happened at all. It might have been put down in the 1950s the way the South and the United States was trying very aggressively to put it down. The Freedom Riders were not all black. Many of them were also white. Many of them were Asian. And it's hard to imagine that today, with the society being so polarized in the United States, with many societies being just as polarized internationally, that achieving a more just, a more democratic society means achieving a society like that for everyone. Not just addressing the economic disparity, not just addressing disparities in social position, but in working actively to reduce those disparities. And it is possible to imagine other societies. We've seen them imagined as recently as 50 years ago. But our contemporary moment has trouble imagining something happening a year ago remembering something happening 10 years ago. The turn of the century is, it, it seems, especially from the perspective of 2020, to be in some other world. And yet it's only 20 years. So most of what we need is a little more perspective. Now, the problem with telling and saying we need more critical thought, more critical discussion, is that most of industrialization has been about telling people not to do that, not to engage in that, that critical thought is above their social standing, it's above their pay grade, as I've heard people say. And that's a problem too. But that's what I mean when I say we have to, as a society, choose to change the values of how we distinguish and how we organize society. Absolutely. Yeah, and um, the the whole idea of even like popularizing science, um, I've come across so many times that you have people from top ap academic institutions, and they actually feel sickened by the fact that they would have to cheapen their work um, and digest it for the public. Um, maybe I'm saying this in a little bit of an extreme way, but um, the idea of like giving something to the public is often seen as like degrading it, whereas actually, or it's seen as communist, and it's it's none of those things. It's actually just like making information accessible and this democratizing society, which is what the internet has been doing um, basically as a byproduct by accident uh, for the last um, 10 years especially um, but um, I would love to chat but uh, fortunately slash uh, unfortunately uh, we have questions from the audience I have okay. to shut up I have to shut up and I have to um, give, give them precedence um, but they're fantastic questions and the, the first one is um, what have experiments with the universal basic income revealed or are the models employed to date overly flawed? Uh, and I also am very aware that we have roughly um, uh, four minutes, three or oh, three I minutes until the that end. Quickly. I can answer Great. that uh, The biggest flaw with universal basic income is the fact that we haven't actually had it roll out at scale. Mm. All of the experiments are 100 people, 500 people, 1,000 people. This is little more than a handout to a small group. Mm -hmm. uh, do universal basic income on a state scale and see what happens. Mm. Mm. Absolutely. Not just a one-time stimulus check, but actually roll it out and see what happens. That's something nobody has tried or even done. So we really can't say whether it's going to work or fail or anything because we have some models, we have a couple of tiny test cases, we have no idea what happens at scale. Mm. 
Yeah. So a true rollout rather than a proof of concept, as is popular with many startups. Um, and actually, maybe you could even give a um, yes or no um, answer to this, if, if possible. Um, there's basically a question whether um, as AI becomes um, more prominent and traditional labor becomes less so, um, do you think that professions in art and culture will become more popular and attain a more central standing in society? Um, traditional art and culture? Probably not, but it depends on what you mean. If you include things like video games, um, animated content, including photorealistic animated content, which is what's coming next, it's already here in some ways, then sure. But it also means that you're not going to have the cultural gravitas around a, a seminal work like, say, Moby Dick. Mm when everybody has their own version of Moby Dick, where they get to be Ishmael, or they get to be one of the other characters, or they get to build Queequeg's coffin, it, it, it becomes kind of weirdly horrifying if you have that traditional set of values in mind. But it's a different set of ideas. Um, Benjamin Franklin commented 300 years ago that the idea of everybody being creative sounded absolutely horrible to him because then no one would buy his books. And that's when profit is key um, to, to what you're doing. <laughs> Michael, th thank you so much. It's been such a stimulating discussion. I'm sure that um, you'll, you and I will have a bit of a follow-up on this as well. Um, and it's been a real honor being able to moderate this discussion. Um, I'd really like to hand over, well, no, I don't want to hand over because I'd like to stay here and chat, but I have to hand over for the sake of time to the moderator back at the studio. Um, I've been Sarah, um, and this has been a great um, sneak peek into your, into your book, um, which I encourage everyone to run and get. Um, as well as a beautiful summary of um, the role of AI in society from a multidisciplinary perspective. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me. Sarah Pollock and Michael Betancourt, thank you so much for that very profound exchange and also proving that critical thought should be above nobody's pay grade and the, what the reasons for that are, uh, I think was highlighted by your debate. Uh, thanks so much. And uh, with that talk, I would like to wrap up today's uh, second day of the AI week of here, the Aspen Institute in Germany. I, and I would also like to invite you to take part tomorrow because this continues for another three days and just give you a quick outlook on what's going to happen tomorrow. On December the 9th, the third day of the AI week here, there will be a keynote presentation by Jana Kula, on the, sci the scientific director of the Algorithmic Business and Production Research Department at the German Research Center for Artificial Intelligence. So the titles are getting longer here. There'll be a debate on the big player startups and the innovation paradox. And there will be a conversation in English with Mustafa Suleiman, the co-founder of DeepMind and vice president of artificial intelligence at Google. So with that, we leave you for today and hope very much that you'll tune in back tomorrow on Wednesday um, for the AI week here at uh, the Aspen Institute. Thanks so much for being with us today. <laughs>